Hey everybody, Meredith Baker here with On The Map, Off The Radar, and I want you guys to imagine that you are living in complete darkness. You're not going to see the sunrise for another few months. The temperature outside is 100 degrees below zero and you're at 10,000 feet altitude. And to many of you, this might sound like the start of a sci-fi movie, but to a brave few who winter over in Antarctica every year, this is a reality. And we have doctor and scientist Christian Otto with us, who has wintered over in Antarctica twice and also climbed Mount Everest and served as a doctor there to talk about what it was like to live in these extreme conditions. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, my pleasure, Meredith. Yeah, happy to be here with you. And I want to just start trying to wrap my head around it. I mean, I could barely survive a winter in Boston. So what prompted you to go to Antarctica and live in the most inhospitable environment on the planet? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot, actually. And, and you know, I've always been interested in human performance in extreme environments and uh, pursued a career in medicine. And uh, these things just sort of uh, clicked for me to be able to do medicine in these remote environments. and. Uh, so I, I started you know, trying to find a position with an Antarctic program and uh, uh, was luckily hired on by the U.S. Antarctic program and uh, so my first tour was at McMurdo Station which is the largest base and the largest U.S. base which is uh, on the Ross Sea on the coast and so I spent my first year there and uh, I guess I enjoyed it enough wanted to go back again and had the opportunity to go to the flagship station, which is much more remote, uh, the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. So being able to take care of a remote community uh, in an environment like that, um, using your physician skills, and it, it doesn't appeal to everyone because you, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty because it's such a broad practice of medicine, you're the only uh, physician. Uh, in the past uh, 10 years, they now have a secondary provider at the level of a, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner. But So the individual has to be very comfortable practicing a wide breadth of medicine and you're really essentially taking uh, care of a small mini hospital as well and all the equipment and, and so on. Wow. And how big was the team um, of people who wintered over in Amundsen and what criteria did you see that was commonly present besides people's technical capabilities. Yeah, so it, it was interesting. The year that I wintered over at Amazon Scott South Pole, uh, it was the largest winter crew they'd ever had, 86 in fact, because they were finishing construction of the new elevated station. So not only was there the uh, uh, maintenance crew or the people who maintained the station, but there was a large construction presence because they were building the largest station ever on the Antarctic continent um, and it was being completed that year so that's why we had such a large contingent typically the winter over crew is around 50 and it's to support the station continue the science projects that are ongoing during the winter over because it's during the summer period which is much shorter four months where you really have a high pace of activity that's when all the, the scientists come in they you know, set up or check on their experiments and um, so there's, uh, it's much busier and there's access during that period of time. And so we had a wide range of individuals. Uh, it really is a science shop. So there's um, uh, astronomy and astrophysics is probably the primary science uh, that's conducted at South Pole, uh, in addition to seismology, uh, uh, some glaciology, and also atmospheric uh, physics and weather. And so it's fascinating because you'll be sitting beside, you know, renowned scientists uh, in the galley and uh, at the same time you've got people from uh, all over uh, the United States who are doing uh, jobs as, you know, er everything from being a chef in the kitchen to someone who washes the dishes to, you know, a plumber, an electrician, etc. So, but I think there's a common thread in that all of these people uh, love adventure and, and being in these kind of environments. I imagine everyone gets very close by the end of their winter there. Well, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, definitely, and, and even if you try and avoid it, you can't. You really do get to know people, and one of the ways I try and explain this to other individuals when they go, wow, how, how could you, what was it like? How could you have done that? And it's really like being at work 24-7 for 365 days of the year, and, you know, you have breakfast with 
your coworkers, you work with them, you have lunch with them, uh, you know, you have dinner with them, you see them in the evening, you see them on the weekends, etc. And you know, you have to stay within the confines of, of you know that working environment. And that kind of gives people a sense for uh, you know what this is like, and most of them don't find that that appealing. But you know, I think combining those challenges with being in this incredibly pristine and, and um, you know a, a, it can be at times dangerous environment. That's that's the appeal. It's not for everyone. Right, I can imagine. Did you oftentimes step outside of the center, or were you indoors the whole time? Yeah, it, it, certainly during the summertime when the sun is up, you know, uh, there's six months of sun essentially. Uh, if people are outside a, a lot more often. It's not as cold as it is in the winter. Um, it's still well below zero, but uh, you get accustomed to the, 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 the cold. Uh, but during the winter, far fewer people will venture outside of the station. And uh, But I made a point to get out uh, just for my, you know, uh, mental outlook and, and uh, that helped me tremendously as particularly when the moon was up you'd get a the moon would be up for six or seven days of the month and it was actually like a cloudy day it was so bright with the reflection of the light on the snow and so I was just fantastic to get out you know and, and ski a few miles away from the station I'd have a radio and then the physician assistant would be would be there if anything happened and call me back but uh, there are some times when I would get, be able to ski far enough away lose sight of the station and it was just it's the quietest you would ever heard. You could hear a pin drop, and it's just millions of stars in the in the sky. The moon is up, and you really felt like you were on another world. Wow. Yeah. So, I found that really helpful. That must have been remarkable to be out there, kind of in the middle of nowhere in the South Pole oh, yeah, by yourself. Oh yeah. You know, I'm talking now about you know it's it's giving me goosebumps thinking about it again. I mean, it was, that was just it was a really powerful experience, and uh, you know, this is going back ten years now. And as a physician there, what were some of the main medical and psychological um, effects of living in such an isolated and extreme environment that you encountered, and how did you um, deal with these challenges? Yeah, so the psychological aspects are, are extremely challenging, and that's actually what uh, initially brought me to NASA, is um, my experience and interest there in human performance in these environments. and. The, the changes and the challenges that occur at, at, Ant at Antarctic Research Stations are very similar to what happens in space flight. And there were also uh, medical challenges. It was actually our busiest year medically in the history of the program. But the, the psychological challenges are really first and foremost. And you've got a group of people um, living in an isolated environment, and there's a lot of social monotony. And by that, you're always with the same people all the time. And, um, you can refer to it as like cabin fever. Fever. If anyone's ever been stuck, in, you know, in their home on a long weekend and the weather's bad, you know, they might start to get a little bit antsy. Well, imagine being stuck there for 365 days with the same people, and we know that has psychological impacts. And for example, at the beginning of the year, everyone's in the galley enjoying themselves, having a fun time, chatting, interacting. By the end of the winter over, people. It's, it's a ghost town. There might be two or three people sitting. They're all sitting by themselves. People generally go and get their food and go straight back to their rooms because the room is the only place where you can be alone and you, you don't have, you get some separation from these people that you've stood shoulder to shoulder with, you know, 24 hours a day, okay. on and on. So those things are similar to some of the challenges in long duration space flight. On the medical side, uh, and, and sorry, just couple other items. It really comes down to two things. The first I mentioned was the social monotony and being with these same people. The other thing is the sensory deprivation. I mean, as human beings, you know, the brain thrives on sensory stimulation. And when you're in this environment, you know, you don't get to go on a holiday. You don't get to go home. You don't get to go for a bike ride or, or go on holidays, etc. You're stuck in this environment. It all looks the same. You're surrounded by, you know, snow and ice as far as you can see so you don't get that sensory stimulation and we think that that actually has biological impacts on the brain in a negative way um, medically uh, it was our busiest year that we'd ever had at South Pole Station uh, we had five major medical incidents we had an outbreak of uh, influenza A it actually shut down the station for a day during the summer um, 
uh, you know, 26% of the station developed influenza. Um, we had a major trauma, uh, a blunt chest trauma at South Pole. We had to activate the walking blood bank the first time we'd had to do that in the history of South Pole Station. The injuries were so severe um, with uh, internal bleeding. The individual had a collapsed lung, multiple broken ribs, bleeding into the cavity lining the heart. And uh, fortunately, uh, you know, all of our training and systems worked, and this was during the summer, we were able to stabilize the patient and fly them out. And, and uh, they survived and recovered and actually came back to winter over a couple of years later. What so, a tough person. <laughs> absolutely. And so that really, you know, tells you, you know, bad things can happen there, and typically they don't, but, you know, um, you need to be prepared for those types of, you know, uh, incidents. And was there, or do people also run the risk of developing some like a vitamin D deficiency for not being in the sun for so long. Well, absolutely, and that's very insightful. And in fact, uh, we looked at vitamin D for the first time uh, in 04 and 05, and that came about because the physician assistant, uh, you know, noticed that we had lots of calcium tablets and didn't want them to go bad. Thought we should give them out. Thought that was a good idea. And I happen to remember something from medical school: don't you need vitamin D to absorb? Calcium, and we started looking into this. And obviously, during the winter over period, there's no um, ultraviolet light that, that penetrates, uh, that gets to the surface there, so you can't produce vitamin D on the skin, and people are usually clothed. So, we actually uh, did a study and looked at vitamin D levels, and they are extremely low because uh, we drew blood on individuals before uh, sundown and then at sun up and the vitamin D levels were extremely low. In fact, we had a couple people that were in the range of uh, rickets, rickets disease, um, you know, extreme vitamin D uh, or D deficiency and, and uh, calcium deficiency in the bones. And we know we've had a problem at, in the Antarctic with delayed bone healing, and at South Pole we thought that might be due to the lower oxygen content because as you, as you pointed out, it is at altitude but it's probably the vitamin D deficiency that, that plays a role. So now there are a bunch more sun lamps and well, vitamin D. Yeah, and, and people are encouraged now to right, take vitamin D through the winter, and, and, that, and that has psychological benefits as well. And we, you know, we, we do recommend that uh, if people can bring a, 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 like a sun lamp, as you mentioned, that's helpful as well, because there's a lot of, we see the rate of uh, sleep disorders increase through the winter over period. And it may not just be due to the change in the light cycle, but it may be a manifestation of the stress, too. And so all that you've learned in Antarctica, have you found that um, it's been useful in the current work you're doing here at NASA? Absolutely, without a doubt. I, I really think that the life in, uh, at a research, Antarctic research station, the science that's being conducted, it's really, you know, an operational environment and by that I mean there are specific objectives people are there to do a task they have to get along and also live in this uh, challenging environment and that's really that's a uh, that's exactly what space flight is all about and you know uh, I think that uh, those challenges can be applied to, to space flight and in many ways living in an Antarctic research station is is um, there are some challenges that exceed being on the space station. So for example, during winter over, it may take two weeks to try and get someone out, away from South, out of South Pole if they're seriously ill or injured. There's only been two real medical evacuations from the winter, whereas on the space station, you could deorbit and have the individual home in 24 hours. So I think in that sense, it uh, can teach us a lot about future long duration missions, for example, to Mars, which may be up to three years long, and, you know, the kind of uh, expertise you need, exactly, preventative measures and, and how to keep people healthy during those kind of expeditions and missions. Wow, well thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. Now, I'm <laughs> fed my wanderlust to want to go to the South Pole, although I definitely don't have the uh, qualifications or um, ability to withstand cold weather as you do. <laughs> oh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, thanks. Thank you, and thanks everyone for watching on the map off the radar.